Stay tuned for a special edition of the Multifamily Deal Lab podcast. It wasn't burned when we first got it under contract. So we had it under contract. Um, There was a major fire. Actually, a boyfriend of a tenant had came and set his girlfriend's apartment on fire. And it it didn't work the first time. So he came back about a week later and set her apartment on fire again. (laughs) Jesus. Um, and so the insurance actually counted that as two uh, entirely separate incidences. Um, but it ended up taking nine months to close and 21 revisions to the PSA. So it just kept getting hairier and hairier and more interesting. And that scared some investors off. Welcome to the Multifamily Deal Lab podcast, where we dissect a deal before your eyes and ears so you can discover the strategies and tactics that got each deal to the finish line. Strategies and tactics that you can put in your own toolbox to get you to the closing table. From sourcing the deal, raising, due diligence to the property takeover, Multifamily Deal Lab shows how you too can get the deal done. And now here's your host, David Lindahl. Paul Williams, welcome to Multifamily Deal Lab. Thanks, Dave. It's good to be here. Tell everybody, tell everybody who you are, where you're from, and who your partners are. So um, I'm Paul Williams. I live about an hour north of Austin, Texas, and uh, my partners are Ben and Max, Multifamily Geeks, which uh, we've been around with uh, with the, the Lindell program for a long time. So, so some, some people may be familiar with us. Yeah, multifamily geeks. I'd never heard that term before. Hmm, I might have to. I might have to swipe that. That's a good one. Um, all right. So you did a deal. It was uh, an older deal. Nineteen seventy eight was it or nineteen seventy nine? Nineteen seventy three. Okay. First of all, how did you? How did the three of you get together and become partners? Let's start there. Well, we met at uh, I think it was Ultimate Partnering Nine, which was twenty seventeen, maybe. And I yeah. was investing in Atlanta. Uh, they were investing in Atlanta and, uh, you know, we kind of came together over values because we talked about core values and what's important to us. And in a partnership, we found that we had a lot of overlapping relationships and uh, we kind of aligned on the values. And so we just uh, were like, hey, let's see if we can do some stuff together. And now, you know, three or four years later, we're still, you know, hitting it. Still doing stuff together. Yeah. That's awesome. Since you mentioned it, I'm going to plug it. Ultimate Partnering 2021 is going to be in Dallas, Texas, October 1, 2, and 3. The early bird special is on right now. It's a, it's, it's an early, early bird because we don't even have the landing page up. You'd have to call the office uh, to get the special at 781-878-7114. By the way, tell everybody about what Ultimate Partnering is in, well, your, in your view. Yeah, Ultimate, Ultimate Partnering is a great event. I think all of the Lindahl events are you know, just great events. Um, somehow you managed to put good people in a room. So uh, ultimate partnering is where people with money get together with people that have deals and uh, new students come to kind of meet some people that are making it happen. And uh, people that have been at it for a while get to, you know, it's kind of like a reunion. So it's kind of a multi, uh, multi-purpose multi deal. Um, and then, you know, we learned some new products uh, that are available to, um, you know, to implement in our business and get fired up and usually meet some interesting. Kind of, and you get to, and you get to meet people that just a business partner with as well. That's another yes. aspect of partnering. Somebody sure. told me one time that, you know, that have been gone to have, that have gone to all the ultimate partners. I think we're on uh, number 14 right now. Um, is that it's the, it's the most amount of people doing deals in any one room that they've ever been in, hmm. uh, which is awesome. Um, all right, so let's go. Let's go to the deal here. So the three of you met there. Um, so how did this deal come about? How did you find it? Well, our property manager uh, actually brought it to us. He knew he had heard about the deal. Um, he knew about it that it was coming, and so he he's like, "Hey, you guys are doing deals. Take a look at this one." So we took a look. You know, it penciled out, and uh, so we just you know, we're like, "Let's do it." So. Well, let me ask you a question because to talk about the fire, to talk about the, you know, this aspect of this deal where there was a fire, because, because after that, I'm going to ask you, so how did this deal pencil out with the fire? You know, how did you determine how you're going to make this deal work? How did you analyze it? Sure. Well, um, it wasn't burned when we first got it under contract. So we had uh-huh. a contract. Um, there was a major fire, actually a 
boyfriend of a tenant had came and set his girlfriend's apartment on fire and it and it oh, didn't wow. work the first time so he came back about a week later and set her apartment on fire again <laughs> Jesus. Um, and so the insurance actually counted that as two uh, entirely separate incidences um, but it ended up taking nine months to close and 21 revisions to the PSA so it just kept getting hairier and hairier and more interesting and that scared some investors off <laughs> so there was 113 units how many how many units actually went down with the fire um, one of the four buildings so 27 units Wow, 27 units. That's a lot. Yeah. It's a quarter of the property. Yeah. yeah. What did, was it to the ground? Um, no, it was, it was, the entire building was condemned and uninhabitable. Um, and, and that's part of the reason it took so long to close because we were trying to make sure that we were in a safe position. Um, all right. So you, when you first analyze the deal, the numbers worked and then all of a sudden there's a fire that's going to certainly, um, uh, hurt the, hurt the cash flow. So now how did you, how did you analyze the deal? And, and the, and the next question after that is, um, who, who got the, so did you, did you get the insurance claim? Did they sign the insurance claim over to you? Yes. Now, by the way, I, I just want to throw this out here the deal changed so much over time. It just kept changing and changing with the insurance proceeds and the fire and this and that and taking so long to close. So if I get, if, if I fumble over any of the numbers, then, then it's just because the deal kept changing and evolving. Um, so when it had the fire, we started to back out of the deal. We're like, okay, we're, we're out. And my property manager actually was part of the team that, acquired the, another property from the seller and they had a really good smooth transition they're like hey look you bought the last deal we had with you guys went really smoothly we want you to buy this and we're like well it it doesn't make sense anymore they said well we will assign the insurance proceeds to you uh which made it a lot more interesting um but then it took a very long time for us to figure out are they actually going to turn this over to us um, how much are we going to get? They ended up, they were going to get a $3.15 million in insurance proceeds as they rebuilt it. Well, we had our attorneys look at it. Our attorney's friends looked at it. We sent this, you know, looking at it from every different angle, because once it transfers ownership, the insurance company can say, well, we don't owe you anything. You're, it's not your deal. The previous owner doesn't even own it. So the seller actually put $2.8 million into escrow um, in case the title, the uh, insurance company didn't pay up. So we oh, had assurance wow. that even if the insurance didn't pay anything, uh, which this seller was very motiv motivated to get them to pay since <laughs> they had $2.8 million on yeah. the line. Um, so we're like, you know what, 90% of it, that's good enough assurance for us. Um, and if, and if something happens, we don't collect it all, then, uh, you know, we'll still be safe. Did you have a problem collecting? Uh, no, we didn't. In fact, um, the, when we did the rebuilding, the uh, county or the city said, you have to install a fire hydrant on the premises, which was an extra $150,000. The insurance company mm -hmm. actually helped uh, pay for, for that. Oh, wow. That's great. So, um, how much did it actually cost you to rebuild? Did uh, we you send the whole 3.1? Not quite. And the three, the 3.1 million that we got actually allowed us to rebuild the, the units almost, you know, basically to brand new 2020, mm -hmm. 2021 specifications. Um, and it gave us money to do quite a bit of renovation on the other 86 units. Wow. You know, but we spent just how, how much, how much extra did you, yeah. Cause that's the thing about insurance, uh, insurance, um, claims if you do the deal right you know with the insurance company then you can you usually get a lot more um okay. than what it costs you to rebuild it um and, and if you do it wrong the insurance company strings you along strings you along strings you along and, and tries to give you less than what it costs to rebuild it until you get um, so you had mentioned it at the very beginning that that it was considered two claims so was that still to your advantage 
Um, no, it's a big disadvantage because the insurance on the property, I think, was $150,000 a year. So thinking 113 units, I mean, that's what, $1,200 a unit per year? is very, very high. Um, and finally, just, I don't know, four or five, six months ago, the insurance comp company came in and said, okay, we're cutting your rates down to normal since you haven't had any claims in two years and the building is in, you know, all of your buildings are in great shape. So wow. eventually it worked out, but. It took That's good for the cash flow. But what I meant though is would you, if you had two different claims on there uh, and you had to rebuild the thing entirely, you paid for the first claim and then you got extra money because, you know, it, there was a fire right after that. So therefore, you know, no money was spent on the renovations. Um, so that happened while we were under contract still. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so there was only one. I mean, they submitted a claim uh, or reported a claim to the insurance. And then a week later, they had to report another one, which you know, the insurance company hadn't even processed the first one. So they just counted it oh. as, they only paid out once, but they charged us, you know, as, as though it was two. Yeah. All right. So, um, so you made out, uh, you were able to do renovations on the rest of the property, which is a plus. So how did, so you started raising funds for this deal, then there's a fire and all of a sudden you realize it's not going to cash flow for a couple of years and the investors aren't going to get their returns. And so how, what did you say to your investors? Yeah, so we had a couple of different issues with this because the people that we were originally raising money from, it took nine months to close because of all the, the craziness involved. And so some of the ones that committed initially, when it came time, seven, eight, nine months later, and all the changes and all that, some of them were out. But then a lot of them, when we told them there was no dividends for the first two years, you know, a lot of them were like, eh, it sounds too risky. It was a real challenge for us to raise the money, um, but we actually pitched it at Shark Tank at Ultimate Partnering Ten, um, and you know picked up picked up some investors there. So uh, that's pretty sweet. Yeah. So this is another plug for Shark Tank. One of the things we do there is uh, we put a bunch of investors on stage. Uh, we pre-screen some deals that are going to go in front of them to pitch. Um, and then Paul was one of those. But the beauty about pitching in front of the sharks is you're actually pitching in front of the whole room. Number one, but number two, you get to actually watch other people pitch. You get to you get to hear the questions that the sharks ask. So therefore, um, you know you should know what the questions are going to be when you go in front of your own investors because typically, you know, those are some of the best investors up on that stage. So yeah, so all right, so good. So you got to fund it at uh, Ultimate Partnering, yes, as well. So that's all. So that's awesome. So did it take two years to get uh, the revenues? Well, I mean, that, that's the big thing. You know, you go. You go. I guess you had the advantage there because you were in a room. You you know you were presenting to the sharks, but you were in a room of um, uh, a large group of people. They all heard it, so they they went in knowing that this property had a fire. Instead of you know go you may go to your list or worse if you don't have a list and then you're going out into the into the marketplace and you try to raise funds for a deal that's not going to cash flow for two years. That's probably one of the hardest things that you ever can do. I, I mean, even no cash flow for one year is difficult. Yeah, I didn't realize how important the cash flow was to a lot of the investors, but it was it was huge. They're like, no dividends for two years, I'm out. And then the ones that did invest, knowing there was no dividends for two years, some of them were calling a, a year, year and a half into it saying, hey, why aren't we getting dividends? So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they kind of forget, huh? Yeah, yeah. So what was the annualized return? No dividends for two years, but was it a five-year hold? Projected? Uh, yeah. It was supposed to be a five-year hold. We're under contract to yeah. sell now. Um, okay, hold on. Before you go there, um, so it was a. Uh, so what? What did? What, what were your annualized returns? So no, 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 for, no uh, returns for the first. No cash on cash for the first two years. What was the whole annualized return for the deal? Uh, You're projecting. Yeah, let me see. I want to say it was uh, projected to be around eighteen percent. We, we were thinking it was going to be uh, 20%. And so we told everybody 18%. Uh, yeah, smart. Try to, try to uh, under promise and over deliver. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, you know, hopefully um, their expectations and then beat them. So even then, you know, 18% is a good annualized return. Uh, you know, in, in an annualized return, that, that for those that aren't familiar, you take your cash on cash return, you add it to whatever the disposition returns are. And then you divide it by the number of years and that gives you annualized return. 
So even though nobody was getting any money the first two years, the last three years it was cash flowing pretty good. And you know, at the end, the resale made it so that all in all, this was a this was a good deal. But because the money doesn't come in regularly at the beginning, it's really difficult to sell a deal like that. Um, so let me see before I go into what you so you have it under contract now. Um, what to so what did you did somebody make you an offer? Did you decide has it has been five years? Did you decide it was time to put it on the market? How did it get on the market? Um, we got some unsolicited offers. Um, ah. So, you know, just, you know, some offers came to us and we, uh, you know, tried to pit them against each other and, you know, see if we could raise, you know, up the ante. And, and uh, so, yeah, that's, they just came in unsolicited and we got them high enough to where. Isn't it, isn't it great when you're on the other side of it, when you're a seller, you know, and you go through all of these years of, of uh, competing for deals and you do those seller calls and, you know, you give them, you know, best and final and you give them your best offer and then you do the final seller call, you know, and you're talking back and forth and then the broker always comes back and says, okay, that sounds really good, but do you think you can sharpen your pencil just a little bit more, right? And, it, don't, and, and then, then you get in the position where you're a seller. You know, and you've got competing offers and you get to get to say the same thing. And isn't that such a great feeling? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> All right. So, so what do you, what do you have it on the contract for? Do you, do you want to say, or? Sure. Um, it's 8.225 million. Wow. That's a big, uh, so 4.4, the insurance money paid for all the fire damage. Now you have an 8.2. That's a huge return. Well, so 4.4, we got 3.1 yeah. insurance money. We spent a little bit less than that. So really we're all in for um, uh, 7.2, 7.3. And then we're yeah, selling- Yeah, that insurance money wasn't out of your pocket though, right? Right, but it's still a part of the- uh, No, it wasn't out of our pocket. <laughs> yeah, about so, you get, so you really got 4.4 in. Um, well, there was a, I got to think about this because we did have, there was some bridge loan involved also. Mm -hmm. So it ends up we're we're delivering the returns that we hoped for. Yeah. But we're not like, it's not like double or triple that. No. Oh, seems like, yeah, it must've been. So did you need a bridge loan to do the repairs or did you need a bridge loan to get into the 4.4? Yeah, we had a bridge loan to get it closed because, you know, fourth of the units were down there was a big fire you know so so we had to go in with a bridge yeah but that's still less than the, when you close on that deal not including insurance how much are we all in for um well we we raised 2.1 million the bridge loan was for yeah. uh the bridge loan was for six million the bridge loan was of six million yes you know and, and it changed a few times so, um, and then you get 3 million back from the insurance company. Yes. So oh, all yeah. in all, I don't know how the numbers all shake out, but we're, we're delivering yeah. the returns. It's a really, it's really confusing. Um, it, 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 so, it, it, all right. So you're, but you're, you're returning, you, you're going to return the returns that you projected going in. Yes. Yeah. And we've done it. We've, okay. You know, we've been doing deals alongside this. Um, you know, so we're, so, uh, you know, I had to actually do some research just to refresh my mind on this one because it's kind of on autopilot right now. So I'm like, okay, let me yep. run over the numbers. So, yeah, it's it's nice when deals get on auto, autopilot and you don't really have to worry about them. They're producing, you know, the cash flow is coming in and no real problems. It's that's a really nice feeling to have. Um, all right, so good. So what was the, other than the other than the um, the fire? Well, any other challenges on this deal? Yes. So the, um, the city, normally, you know, we can send our whole crew, our construction crew in there to do everything all at once, you know, the windows and the roof and the framing. And, you know, we can kind of stagger them as long as they're not tripping over each other. Well, the city said, you can only have one trade in the building at a time. So you can't have an electrician and a plumber in the building at the same time. You can't have a plumber in the, and the framer in the building at the same time. You can't have a roofer and a plumber going. So they made us separate out each one of the trades 
you know, and not do everything all at once. That was really wow. frustrating because, you know, we thought the, um, you know, we thought the renovation was going to take a year and it ended up yep. taking close to almost two years. Wow. So that was, that was really frustrating for us. That was a big surprise. And then of course, um, we had, um, a, a bit of delinquency in Alabama, uh, during, during COVID. Life. Yeah. Yeah. How'd you handle that? Um, just trying to communicate with the tenants, um, you know, helping some of them with, you know, rental assistance and, you know, applying for that. Uh, but yeah, there, it was, it was easy to, to not pay rent and stay there. Um, so we had some issues mm -hmm. with that. <laughs> yeah. That wasn't just in Alabama. There were some, you know, if your if your tenant base was service type of, uh, tenants, then right. that, that issue was, was, was nationwide. Which we didn't have that. We didn't have that in some of our other places. Were they the same type of tenants uh, in terms of job, tenant profile? No, better, better jobs, better jobs. Yeah. 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 That, that was the, I, and I know going into deals uh, during COVID, that's one of the things we looked at doing during due diligence is we actually during, you know, a lot of, it all depends on the property, but a lot of times we won't actually look at um, all the employment from all, for all of the different tenants, but you know, going into COVID when we were doing deals, it was, we looked at all the employment. We wanted to make sure that, you know, they were gainfully employed and they were going to stay that way. It wasn't going to be affected by COVID. Right. Um, what was the reasoning that the uh, city gave you for only allowing one particular contractor type in at a time? They kind of just make their own rules over there. And uh, they just decided for whatever reason that they only wanted one trade at a time. I don't know if they were being lazy or if it was, uh, I'm not sure what that reasoning is, but. Yeah, we definitely had some frustration with uh, with the city <laughs> not cooperating. Yeah, that is odd. Yeah, you know, you but you, and that doesn't happen. It's not a unique case, unfortunately. You know, you you try to do the best you can for a property. You know, because because you want to, you know, you want to have a great property. You want to get a great return. You do the best for the tenants. You do the best for the. You want to cooperate with the city and do the best for the city and make everything look good and have everybody happy. And right. sometimes you get into a city and uh, oh boy. You know, they just come after you. It's like, what's going on? All I'm trying to do is improve the place. Right. right. Um, so, um, all right. So, so the city situation, now you, you're, you're exiting the deal. Um, your partners are, you guys have been doing more and more deals. Let me ask you a question. How, so you started investing how many years ago? Uh, well, in multifamily, 2018. You started investing in multifamily properties in 2018? Yes. Yeah, I started coming to the events in early 2017. Okay. All right, good. So how has uh, investing in multifamily properties changed your life? Um, well, real estate in general has given me some freedom to, uh, you know, just take, you know, I guess just freedom over my schedule and my life. And, you know, uh, two years ago, I took the family, my wife and four kids on a two-month tour around the world. And... Wow. Yeah, just, you know, I don't have the ordinary, uh, you know, nine to five, which is sometimes good. Sometimes it's, sometimes I wish I had a nine to five, but, but, you know, for the most part, I have freedom over my schedule and, and, uh, you know, I have more money than I had, you know, working in the, for somebody else. So, and then I think, I'm, go ahead. And then doing this deal gave me the, uh, <laughs> I don't, I'm not sure the confidence to, uh, do, more interesting hairy deals or or maybe the award to, to stay away <laughs> yeah, from Yeah, that could be a good or a bad thing. Deals like this, yeah. Nice momentum cash flowing deals are 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 great. Right. So let me ask you a question on in terms of uh, cash flow. I always say that, you know, cash flow is great because it gives you better choices. Uh, appreciation is where you, where you create your true wealth. In terms of cash flow giving you choices, what better choices do you have now that you didn't have when you didn't have cash flowing properties? Can you come off the top of your head? Sure. Um, well, like when we vacation, we like to vacation during the week when other people are at work and school and things like that. So like we take our vacations kind of Monday through Friday and then we'll leave, you know, noon on Friday. And then when it gets crazy on the weekends, you know, all the crowds can go there. And so it, yeah. it's, it's kind of given us that ability. Um, yeah, not, 
you know, not having to depend on somebody else for, uh, you know, for income. Yeah, that's pretty sweet. That's a great feeling. All right, we're going to go into what we call lightning round. You ready? I'm going to ask you a series of questions. You just answer whatever comes off the top of your head. Sure. All right. Okay. First one. Would you rather? Would you rather come face to face with a miniature hippo hippopotamus or a giant cockroach, knowing that both are in a bad mood? Oh man, I hate cockroaches and types of flying German cockroaches. Um, but a hippo? Oh man, I don't know. That's a bad one. A hippo. I'll go with a hippo. All right. When was the last time you stayed up past four o'clock in the morning? Uh, 2018 on my trip. <laughs> <laughs> nice. What's your favorite uh, dessert? Ice cream. When you fly on a plane, do you wear a neck pillow? Yes. What's your favorite song to sing when you're singing by yourself? Hmm. I don't know. I have the tiger, maybe? Really? That's a good one. I don't usually sing it, though. I usually play it when I'm working out. Yeah. That's pretty good. What, what, was your, um, what was the name of the street that you grew up on? Linda Lane. Hold on a second. What was the name of that street? Linda Lane. Oh, Linda Lane. I thought you said Linden Street. Linden Street has a uh, fond memory in my uh, um, for me because when I first started buying multifamily properties, I thought, well, you know, we didn't have any money back then. I started buying single family properties to flip so I could buy more multifamily properties. And the first property I bought was on Linden Street. Oh. And uh, I remember I was cocky, you know, I was buying houses and uh, I bought it off foreclosure. The owner was still in there. I knew I couldn't go into the property and start doing work. But I had also learned at that time that the longer a property uh, you hold it, the more money it's going to cost you. So I sent my guys over there to start the painting right away on a Friday afternoon. And uh, one of my guys calls me, he says, Dave, you know, the, the, the previous homeowners in here and he tells us to get off the property and we can't paint and I said, you tell him that I own that property now and you guys, we're not going to go on the inside, but we have every right to be on the outside, yada, yada, like an idiot, you know? So uh, that's what he told them. And uh, the next day I go to the beach. I was living in a one bedroom apartment, old, old apartment, you know, no, no, um, uh, no dishwasher, porcelain, 1950s sink, you know, I come in from the beach and I see my answer machine blinking. <clears throat> so um, I go over there and it's one of my friends and he says, Dave, what's going on over at Linden Street? You know, they've got all of the, um, it's all cordoned off and there's fire department and hazmat trucks over there. And what's going on? And I thought, hmm, I wonder what is going on. So I called the fire department and I said, hey, what's going on on Linden Street? And they said, who's this? And I said, like the cocky idiot I was, I'm one of the owners. And he says, oh yeah, what number? And as soon as he said that, my, my stomach started to turn, right? And I said, uh, very sheepishly, 75. He said, you get over here right now. And I was like, oh, shit. And I said, I said, what? I said, I'm not going anywhere until you tell me what's going on. He said, what was in the garage? I said, I don't know. I just bought the property three days ago. He said, he, he said, I said, well, I don't know why. What, what, what happened in the garage? He said, there's a cloud coming out of the garage hovering over the neighborhood and they don't know what it is. And, I thought, and I'm thinking, oh, my God, there's probably people, you know, on the, on the sidewalk dead from whatever this is. So come to find out that the previous owner was like a knife, um, um, worked with knives and he had nitric oxide that he used in a five gallon container. And after he cleared up all his stuff, he was so pissed off at me, he, you know, for being so cocky. After he cleared out all his stuff, he kicked over the five gallon of nitric oxide, knowing that it was going to send this cloud in the air. So it wasn't hazardous, but when they found out what it was uh, and they cleaned it up, they sent me the bill for $36,000 which I didn't make any money on that house. And I learned a big lesson, you know? Uh, so when you said Linda Street, I, I, my earpiece fell out. I thought you said Linden Street. But anyways, mm -hmm. so that was my first experience. Unfortunately, it wouldn't be my last experience with hazardous materials, but that was my first experience with hazardous materials. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so let's continue. Um, what was your grandmother's favorite curse word? Or grandfather? Uh, you know, I don't remember. I don't remember them. They were always telling me like Bible verses and stuff. So I don't remember any. Oh, really? <laughs> okay. Yeah, so uh, Black Bean. Bad, then they would, they would uh, reply with a, you know, a verse. So, <laughs> or sweet. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. What nation, what, what, uh, where are they from? What nationality? Uh, fifth generation Texans. Oh, fifth generation. Okay. Uh, black beans or refried beans in your burrito? Refried. 
What is ruder, a French waiter or a dog barking at midnight? Dog barking at midnight. If you, and if you could be a fly on a wall, whose wall would you sit on and listen in? This is supposed to be a lightning round, isn't it? Um, genies. Genie in the office? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a good one. All right, and the final question. If poison expires, is it more poisonous or is it no longer poisonous? It's more poisonous. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know the answer to that one. All right, that's, a, that's the latest edition of Deal Lab. Uh, that, this is Paul Williams. That's the deal he did in Birmingham, Alabama. And uh, thank you, Paul. Thanks for joining us. It was and thanks fun. everybody else for being on the line.